upon all occasions to comply with the dissenters both in public and private affairs as persons of tender conscience and piety to promote their interest in elections, to sneak to them for a places and preferment, to defend toleration and liberty of conscience, and under the pretense of moderation to excuse their separation and lay the fault upon the true sons of the church for carrying matters to I, if to court the fanatics in private and to hear them with patience, if not approbation, rail at and blaspheme the church and upon occasion to justify the king's murder, if to flatter both the dead and the living in their vices and to tell the world that if they have wit and money enough then they need no repentance and that only fools and beggars can be damned, if these I say are the modish and fashionable criterions of the true churchman, God deliver us all from such false brethren! Hello, 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 and welcome to this edition of the Jolly Heretic. Uh, before we start, I'd just like to say a word about our sponsor, and that is Atlas VPN. Now, here's the situation, chaps. We are all truth seekers here at the Jolly Heretic Public House. We all want to know the truth about the world, and the only way we can do that is if we get lots of different perspectives, lots of alternative perspectives. And we are in a situation where we cannot get that. The internet is censored, everything is censored, and we literally cannot get uh, the other side with regard to certain important events that are happening in the world because of the way that they censor the internet. So the only thing to do, as far as I'm concerned, is to use a VPN. And Atlas VPN is currently running a huge discount. It means you can get a three-month subscription for just $1.83 a month, plus three months for free, with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And so time is running out, so it's 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 worth uh, worth looking into, really. Um, there's lots and lots of uh, benefits to this. Um, not only is that you've got that deal, but you could unlock your favourite content from all over the world, you know, shows from friends or whatever it is you like or using Atlas VPN. You can keep your Google searches private. Uh, you, they make sure that your results aren't tracked and so forth. You can stop ads and malware. It's it's more than just a VPN. It blocks malicious links and ads and, and so forth. And it notifies you when someone's trying to steal your data. Um, and you can save money online. It, it, it notifies you of the best deals. Uh, and it can protect unlimited devices. So it seems to be a jolly good idea. And as I say, they've currently got this campaign where it's just uh, $1.00. 83 a month so you know it's it's worth thinking about one dollar 83 a month for a three-year subscription plus three months for free with a 30-day money-back guarantee time is running out so you know it's certainly worth looking into so as a person that uh, is in favor of the truth and wants as much uh, as, as many different perspectives as possible and is finding these blocked by our current system i think getting a vpn is worth doing and as far as i can see atlas vpn is uh, where it's at, chaps. Now, there I was uh, channeling a churchman from the year 1709 by the name of Henry Sacheverell. And Henry Sacheverell was extraordinarily famous in his time. He was so famous that he basically was the reason for a massive Tory landslide in the 1710 election. And the 1710 election illustrated something extremely important, which is that uh, when society is at a certain level of intelligence, it behaves in certain ways. And I want to look at why it does this in a minute, but what it does is, is basically it, it becomes accepted in such a society with such a certain level of intelligence about the same level of intelligence that we have now, which is what they had in about 1700, that uh, basically politics is a brutal game, that it is part of politics, that it's just the way of things in politics that you will go to prison, you will spend some time in prison. If your opponents gain power, you will be prosecuted and you will go to jail. Jail is, and prosecution are an occupational hazard of politics. That's what happens when intelligence drops below a certain level, and that is what we are seeing now with the press persecution of Donald Trump. A new government comes in and they, they prosecute the members of the old government and then when that government comes in they prosecute members of the previous government and so on. That's what happens in a low IQ society and that's what we are seeing with what is happening to Donald Trump at the moment. But before we look at the dynamics of that and why th that's happening exactly, let us look at the 1710 election. 
Now, in 1709, the government of the country of England was Whig. Uh, Whigs were broadly in favour of the power of Parliament as opposed to the power of the king, and Whigs uh, were broadly more tolerant of religious dissenters, of non-conformists and, and people like that. The Tories, they were more in favour of the power of the king. They reflected those that were on the side in the civil war of the, you know, the Cavaliers, um, and uh, they, they, were, they were less in favour of uh, religious toleration. Uh, they were in favour of basically Catholicism and Anglicanism. Now, what happened on the 5th of November 1709 was that every year there would be a sermon preached at St Paul's, because the 5th of November was an important date. It was the date when the gunpowder plot, which was an attempt to blow up the King and Parliament, was solved, and Guy Fawkes was arrested. But it was also the date in 1688 of the Glorious Revolution, in which the Catholic monarchy uh, of King James II was overthrown. Uh, overthrowing is, of course, what happens in coups and whatever. It's what happens in low-IQ societies. I uh, was overthrown and was replaced by William of Orange on the 5th of November 1688. So every year, in celebration of the new Anglican Protestant ascendancy, there would be a sermon preached at St, uh, outside St Paul's Cathedral, a public sermon. And this was a major event. And we've got to understand that at that time, priests, vicars, were major people, in some ways like politicians or you know, celebrities, whatever. Today, it was a significant public event in front of thousands of people. And on the 5th of November 1709, Henry Sackeverell, uh, <coughs> who was really a firebrand, something of an extremist, something of a fanatic, but who was also very hard-working and had lots of contacts, he had been made uh, one of the um, chaplains uh, of the House of Commons, and he was asked by the Lord Mayor of London to preach the sermon. So he preached this sermon essentially attacking the Whig government. It was the Whig junta that was in power uh, and th it attacked the Whig government and basically argued that they, that they were evil, vicious people uh, who were trying to destroy the Church of England. The Whig government had declared the Church of England was no longer under threat <clears throat> from dissenters and, and, and papists and whatever. And he was arguing, no, it is under threat. We are surrounded by these evil non-Anglican people who are trying to destroy the Church of England. And the Church of England was basically code for England uh, and, the, and the, the interests of England. So he was basically sort of inspiring patriotic fervour and saying you have these foreigners, these, these not true English people, really, who are um, in league with foreign powers, i.e. the papists, or who are the enemy within the dissenters, but they are a general problem and they are trying to destroy the Church of England and thus England and thus you. Now, it was said at the time that St Paul's was on fire, that the, 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 the public reaction to this sermon was amazing, it was electrifying, they all felt this sense of righteous fury, that yes, we are the good people, we are the best, we are the, the moral people, and we are under attack from those evil Catholics and those evil non-conformists, those people that aren't quite like us and are therefore threatening us and our interests. So this was a very, very important sermon and it had a huge impact. Of course, it was very damaging damaging to the Whig government. It was very, it was basically anti-Whig. So what did the Whigs do in response to this criticism? Well, of course, they tried to find some way of prosecuting Henry Sackeverell. They tried to find a way of prosecuting him for sedition, but he was very careful in his words. He read the sermon out, and so therefore he was very careful in his words. He probably consulted lawyers to make sure that it wasn't illegal. So that was no good. So they tried to they tried to say, oh, he was, he was somehow uh, inspiring violence or something like that, but there was no evidence that he'd done that. But they got him on some kind, uh, on, they got him on some kind of technicality, and therefore he was brought before the bar of the House of Commons, uh, and there was and there was a and there was a vote uh, in, in in December, and 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 he was censured by the House of Commons, uh, and the sentence was that he should be stopped from preaching for three years, uh, and that his sermon should be burnt. Now, the result of this was that he became a sort of martyr hero in the eyes of the people, and not only that, that the people were so furious about this that there was rioting. There was rioting throughout London. There was serious disorder, uh, a serious anti-Whig rioting, and he had inspired the idea that the Whigs were just evil, vicious people that were trying to destroy England, destroy the Church of England, destroy the true religion, and basically make England an evil, blasphemous place. <clears throat> the following year there was then a general election. Now, of course, in those days, only a tiny percentage of people could vote, and most seats were uncont a lot of seats were uncontested. But the result of this 
fury was that lots and lots of seats were contested that wouldn't otherwise have been contested. And there was a landslide victory against the Whigs for the Tories. So you have the 1710 election, landslide Tory victory. So, then the Tories are in power. So the, the, the Whig chap has been prosecuted and whatever, and now the Tories are in power. So what do they do? Well, of course, they want to prosecute the Whigs who had previously been in power. How do they do that? Well, they want to try and come up with some way of doing so. So they argue that there's about a million pounds missing from the public budget and that somebody is responsible for this, that the, the Whigs have been corrupting. They, they need to take the heat off the idea that they're these anti-religion people and these anti-Church of England people. So they need to cast the Whigs, the previous government, as corrupt. So they find evidence that, that the Whigs are corrupt. Of course the Whigs are corrupt. Everybody was corrupt at the time. The entire system was corrupt. I mean, this was a period in which you had pocket, in which you had open voting, um, in, which, in which people could be bribed to vote the right way. And the whole society was corrupt. But they, um, and so everybody was corrupt. But no, no, because they were in power, looked into the finances and they looked and, and they found lots of evidence, of course they did, that the previous Whig administration was financially corrupt and were abusing their position. Now then we have the next problem, which was that the Secretary of State for War, Robert Walpole, who later became the first acknowledged Prime Minister of, of the UK between 1721 and 1742, the outgoing Secretary of State for War was a brilliant parliamentary speaker uh, and he was brilliant at persuading Parliament that this wasn't the case, that the, 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 the Whigs weren't corrupt, that this was, this was simply untrue. Now, but the political parties at that time were not very stable, so he'd actually stayed in government uh, as the, not as Secretary of State for War, but uh, at first as the, as the Treasurer of the Navy, which was a, a minor post uh, in government. But he kept arguing in Parliament that, no, 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 the Whigs, the Whig government were not corrupt, the Whig government, the, 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 here's the evidence they weren't corrupt, and, 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 and this is nonsense. And so this was under mining the Tory power base. What was the result? The Tories decided to go after him, to go after him personally. He was undermining the case that, that, that the Whigs were corrupt, so the Tories went after him personally. And, ba and based on not really very good evidence, they argued that as as the Treasurer of the Navy in Scotland, um, he had engaged in, in various corrupt activities, that he had been open to bribery and so forth. The evidence for this was not very good, but nevertheless it was enough. And, they, and because they had a, the Tories had a large majority in Parliament, they voted um, to, to prosecute him and, and he was jailed. Now, while he was in jail, he again became a kind of martyr hero. And, and, and he, by, by the way, the, the sort of de facto prime minister at this time was someone called the Earl of Oxford, Harley. Uh, he became a sort of martyr hero. Lots of important people visited him. And it really helped his career. It really helped ultimately in, in his, it, for him to become first Lord of the Treasury, for him to become prime minister, that he spent this time in prison. Now, in 1715, there was a new, uh, a new king. Uh, the, the, there was the, the, everyone knew that Queen Anne was going to die. She was very ill and very fat, and so then there was a new there, there was a new king in the form of George the First, who was only very distantly related to Queen Anne because they needed to have a Protestant on the throne. At that time, you had the Jacobite uprisings. This was the, this uh, Catholic Scottish line, the son of James the First, Second, the Catholic uh, deposed king of 1688, and the Earl of Harley was negotiating potentially with with this uh, with this Jacobite king with the uh, with the pretender. <clears throat> so the result of that was that in 1715, when the Whigs came back into power, the Earl, uh, Har sorry, the Earl of Oxford, Harley, uh, was himself jailed. Um, so, so you, again, the Whigs are now back in, so they jail, effectively, the leader of the opposition. Now, he was jailed potentially for treason, uh, which could have carried the death penalty, uh, but in the end, for various reasons, he managed to get off and he was never executed. And that was really the system of English politics around that time. It was an occupational hazard that you go to prison. Uh, if, you, if you go into the lion's den of politics, it is an occupational hazard that you will spend time in jail if the opposition um, get in. There is no... Re there is no idea that oh we are, we, we are one people and we disagree on certain points of policy, uh, as was argued by McCain against Obama when someone said that Obama wasn't wasn't a true American. There's nothing like that. It's absolute visceral hatred of each other, um, fear of each other, um, and vengeance such that when you get in, you jail the opposition or you try to jail the you, you prosecute the opposition, and that is what is happening in America now. It is a sign of declining IQ. What is intelligence associated with? 
or what is low IQ associated with. Well, uh, Raymond Cattell, in an extraordinarily prescient paper that was written in 1938, argued that in a, in a society of declining intelligence quotient, you're going to see people staying at school longer to make up for the fact that they're stupider. Well, we're seeing that. You're going to see uh, declining educational standards because people are stupider and stupider. You are, of course, seeing that. You're going to see decreasing levels of per capita major innovation. Well, I've looked at that in my book, At Our Wits End. We are, of course, seeing that. We are back at the level of per capita to major innovation that we were at in about 1600. So this is telling you we reached an IQ peak in about 1870 because we, were, we had long been under harsh Darwinian conditions in which the richer 50% of the population had double the surviving offspring of the poorer 50% of the population. Um, intelligence uh, strongly predicts how wealthy you are. This had been going on between about 1100 and about 1800. This was bootstrapping the population. It was making them more intelligent every generation and based on numerous correlates, therefore, we were getting more intelligent across time every generation up until the Industrial Revolution. Uh, as the poor poor 50% had less children than the rich 50%, the poor died off, uh, the, 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 the wealthier had to move down the population every generation to fill the places vacated, and we got more and more and more intelligent. Obviously, with the Industrial Revolution, um, childhood mortality falls from 50% to 1%, um, the, uh, due to medical innovations and so on, and so therefore the selection pressure for intelligence is reduced, uh, reduced heavily. Uh, and, uh, by by about 1920, there was no, well, there was a negative correlation, it seems, in England between intelligence and how many children you had, um, both for reasons of selection pressure changing and also the rise of contraception and various other facts I've looked at in other videos. It's, it's more likely taken up by the higher classes, so the higher classes have fewer children, uh, whereas the, the lower classes are more impulsive, they can't, they can't control themselves, uh, and so they end up having more children, more unwanted children, and also for various reasons it seems that intelligent people in advanced society Societies. They feel a great sense of dysphoria, they're less instinctive uh, and, and therefore um, they're more environmentally sensitive. They're in an evolutionary mismatch and therefore they just don't want to have children. Uh, it's been shown that uh, you, you need to have mortality salience to make you want to have children. So if the mortality sense is not there and you're not very instinctive, which intelligent people are not, then you're less likely to want children. The result of that is there is now a point to negative correlation between how intelligent you are and having children among native European peoples. So <clears throat> the result of this is, and there's numerous uh, markers on this is happening, reaction times, loads of things, we are definitely getting less intelligent. And so what you would expect then is all of these things that, that, he, that he predicted, that Cattell predicted, greater delinquency, a greater interest in sex, as we basically just become more, extinct, more instinctive, but he also noted more extremism and more anti-democratic attitudes. Now, why is that the case? Well, Low IQ correlates with extremism because people that have a low IQ are highly emotional, which is a, a big part of extremist politics, um, and of, they think in a black and white way. They don't see nuance, and that's a big part of extremist politics. And they are certain they are right and wh whatever, um, and this is a big part of extremist politics. And they are basically highly instinctive, and it is highly instinctive um, to see anyone that disagrees with you as evil and so forth, and is basically your enemy. So what we would see in a society of declining IQ is a rise in extremist politics and what this would result in is massive polarisation and therefore two political sides that hate each other and therefore the prosecution of your political opponents. Now, we, based on certain measures, based on uh, uh, vocabulary usage, on, on the use of, of high-order vocabulary, which indicates high intelligence across time in representative samples of texts, we are back not at the intelligence of 1600, which we are with per capita major innovation, but at about the intelligence of 1700, i.e. the intelligence that we are seeing at the time of Walpole's prosecution and at Sacheverell's prosecution. So, uh, the, the, another thing you would see, intelligence correlates with trust. Why? Well, because if you're low in intelligence, you're going to misread things, you're going to misread the social signals, you're going to easily get conned and whatever, you're not going to be clever enough to, to deal with people that are going to con you, so it, be, it works best to trust nobody. Whereas if you're high in intelligence, then you will be able to... Um to to, uh, uh, to to notice that you're going to be conned and whatever, and also um, you will be able to attain benefits from cooperating with people and trusting with people, trusting people, and therefore it, it works out that you will be higher in trust. So as intelligence declines, levels of trust decline. What does this result in? It results in polarization. It results in two sides hating each other. It results in two sides assuming that the other the other side is evil. Uh, well, what's the result? Of course, you prosecute your political opponents in case they prosecute you. Corruption is another sign of 
low intelligence. Why? Well, be, uh, because uh, if you um, you won't understand that uh, it's going to lead to the destruction of society, corruption. If you have low IQ, you'll live in the now rather than in the future, and so therefore you will be more likely to be corrupt, and society will be more likely to be corrupt, and so therefore you will get things that they can be prosecuted for because there will be more corruption. Low empathy. That's another thing. This this correlates with intelligence, empathy at about 0.3. People that have high IQ are more empathetic. People that have low IQ are less empathetic. Why? Well, because you, you can work things out, you can calculate things better with high intelligence, and therefore you can work out how other people are thinking, and you can put yourself in their place more easily. You can logically, coherently do that. If you're less able to do that, you won't be able to do that, and so you're more likely to have no empathy for other people, and you'll just see them as evil, vicious people. And therefore, ultimately, anti-democratic attitudes are a correlate of low IQ. Now, I'm not saying democracy is perfect. I'm not saying that, I, you know, think what you like about democracy. It's just a fact that anti-democratic attitudes correlate with low IQ. Why? Because democracy involves trust. Democracy involves um, uh, be, uh, being, um, being able to trust the other side. Democracy involves involves planning for the future and, and so on. Democracy involves holding in your emotions. Democracy involves accepting that the other side might possibly be right. Democracy involves all these kinds of things that you don't really get with low intelligence. And so for all of these reasons, as our IQ declines, we should expect more extremism, more prosecution of political opponents. We should expect a movement back to what we have at the time of Walpole, where when one government leaves, the other government prosecutes the outgoing government. We should expect this to happen more and more and more. And for politics to be a more and more dangerous game in which prison is basically an occupational hazard. So when we ask ourselves, why is this happening with Trump? Why is it that the Democrats are, pros are looking into prosecuting Trump? It, even if he's guilty, that's not the point. That's not the point. There's probably been plenty of cases in the past in which politicians have... In, it's been possible to get politicians on various technicalities had you wanted to. Um, but people don't do that because they think it's bad for democracy to do that. They think it's bad for public trust. They think it's bad for a cooperative society. They think about the future and they therefore leave it alone. They might even think to themselves, look, none of us are perfect. Uh, probably I could be got on something when I, uh, when I go out. So uh, you, you, I, I, I could be got on some technicality, particularly in a corrupt system where you, 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 could, you can, you can uh, influence judges and whatever. So I better not do that because it could be done to me. That's empathy. Well, these kinds of things are lacking in a lower intelligent society so you just get a sort of childlike constant tit for tat fighting and that's what we can expect and that's what we're that's what we saw in the 18th century and that's what we're seeing now as we have on some measures the same intelligence as we had in the 18th century rather than the peak of high intelligence and cooperation that you see around 1900. OK, well, I hope this has been of interest. If it has, please subscribe. It helps us vitally if you do that. Remember, I live show Mondays and Thursdays, 7pm UK time, 2pm New York. I will see you soon and goodbye! Hello, hello, hello! The Jolly Heretic is an online public house which meets on Mondays and Thursdays at 7pm UK time, 2pm New York, in which we discuss the kind of based fearless science which is increasingly expunged from our woke joke universities. If you want to help support the Jolly Heretic Public House, then please, please, please become one of my patrons on Subscribestar. You can also send in donations using Odyssey and Entropy, and uh, if you want to, you can purchase Jolly Heretic merchandise, such as clothes uh, and mugs. Uh, all of the links are in description, in the description, and it will help most violently uh, if you could help support the Public House. I will see you all soon, and goodbye!